Oh yeah, that's true. Well, well, good evening, everyone. How, how's everybody doing? I do have something that shouldn't be up there. Let's see. There we go. I see that. That's good. Let's see if I can advance. Oh yeah. All right. What more can you ask for? All right. It's good to be here with you this evening for Wednesday night uh, service at Heritage Baptist Church. And uh, it was good to see Pastor in, in the back there. Real good to see him. Um, somewhat surprised, but that, not really that surprised because it's Pastor that he's here. You know, if he can be here, he's going to be here. Uh, whether or not he's good enough to be here, I don't know, but he's here. So uh, it, is, it is very good, though, to see him. Hopefully his pain is starting to be managed to some kind of bearable degree. He, he said, I'm getting used to the new normal. I hope it's not a new no, long-term normal for him to be going through uh, great bouts of pain. I, 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 that's one of my biggest prayers. You know, pain for a day or two is bad enough, but chronic pain, it just wears on you and wears on you. You can, you can mess at your sanity after a while kind of thing. So we're, we're going to pray for Pastor and Miss Sarah and... Uh, Brother Rick, all the ones that Brother Bill just prayed for, that was good. And you, 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 Al, oh, thank you very much, Brenda. Allison, um, you know, she's saying that she may have a, a rough summer, you know, uh, in store for her there. We pray that goes as smoothly as possible and uh, that it's effective in, in treating um, the new bout of cancer that, that she has. Um, anybody else have something you want? To, yes, ma'am. I'm not sure what that really means. She did a TikTok challenge and then that hurt her heart. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's like they press on their chest. Oh, she no. Down, but she, yeah, oh, she, she overdone it? Wow. Yeah. 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 For years, people know that CPR can, you can crack someone's rib cage doing CPR. That's crazy. You don't need to do that unless you really need to do that. But, you know, that's, that's the challenge, huh? Well, we'll pray for April's niece. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. Let's go ahead and... What's that? It's Jeff's daughter, Jeff Oh, it's Jeff Hampton's daughter. What was her name again? Lauren. Lauren. Okay. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, in prayer, Lord. We want to remember those that we just mentioned, Lord, including Lauren, Lord, uh, April's niece, Lauren, that, that you be with her, Lord. And uh, Lord, I pray for the just our, our country, Lord, that you be with us. Lord, help us, Lord, to, to think straight, straightly and think clearly, Lord. Help us, Lord, to come to you for reason. And Lord, um, we just pray, Lord, that you're uh, in that situation, Lord. Help help there not to be any long-term uh, damage there. I want to continue to pray for our pastor, Lord, that you be with him and, and uh, uh, cancer that he's going through, the treatment that he's going through as well, Lord, and, and the pain that he's been experiencing lately, Lord, that you be with him and help him with that, Lord. Pray for Miss Allison, Lord, that you be with her, Lord, as she uh, battles cancer. And uh, pray for Richard, Lord, as, as um, he continues to go through the struggles he has with uh, his mouth and his ear, Lord, and everything involved with that. Lord, pray for uh, Miss Sarah, Lord, that you be with her, Lord, and her upcoming surgery, Lord. We pray, Lord, that, that uh, everything goes well with that, Lord. And also other issues, Lord, that are going on, Lord. Just pray, Lord, that, that you be with her and her family, Lord. And uh, Lord, uh, we pray for our church, Lord, that you guide us and lead us. And Lord, uh, I, Lord, I pray that you give me the, the words to say and the way you want me to say it, Lord, tonight, Lord. And I love you and I pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's go ahead and get into the message. And this is part three and the last part. And, it's, and so I really do need to go through the slides to make sure it's the last one, because I told you it would be the last one. I, and and uh, I didn't mean for it to be a part three. But that's how it's kind of going. So let's move on. And then, so I'm only going to look at a couple verses. Oh, wow, that's interesting. The cap of the clicker fell off on the ground right there. <laughs> no, that, that was, I don't have jokes, so I got to do slapstick now and then. So we'll go on with that. Okay, so the, the main verse uh, of the whole thing was as the, as the eyes of a servant. So if you picture uh, a servant who's 
on call for their master. That's how we re really should be, is ready for the master. So the servant's there waiting and looking at the, you know, basically looking at the face of the master. So as soon as the master needs something, that's, that, this is a perfect picture of a servant, would be ready to do the master's bidding, not have to say, where's that servant at now when I need him? We don't want that, so he's supposed to be ready. So um, it's talking about uh, in Psalms 123.2, Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that he have mercy upon us. And we're, and I'm not going to go through all these again because we've already been through one through four. So we've already had uh, one and two was the sermon and three and four was the sermon. Now we're doing five and six, and that'll be the, the last sermon in this series. But we went over for salvation. And, uh, and you know, of course, we have to look unto the Lord for salvation. There's no other way. We know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. And all we have to do is by faith, trust him and just just call upon his name. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then for mercy and grace. Uh, of course, his mercy and grace were involved with their salvation, but it doesn't end at our salvation. We, uh, it, our mercy and grace continues. And we talk about how his mercy endureth forever. And we're always asking for that mercy. We, we, tonight we called on, on uh, some people, you know, for the Lord. Uh, we lifted up some people in prayer to the Lord. And we're asking God for his mercy. And it continues. So the servant, you know, and we're talking more the servants of, of yesteryear kind of thing. They depended on their master for, for everything. As a matter of fact, if you, if you, from a physical standpoint, there's some salvation going on there too because the master had to let them in. You know, he could have had other servants instead. And to be able to be in that position of a servant could have meant surviving and not surviving. And uh, they look to their master for their, their needs and all that and, and, and hope that the master has mercy and, and, and grace for them. But we have a loving Master, we have a loving Father, and uh, and and our Advocate in Jesus. It's on our side, and His mercy and His grace just keeps on showing up in our life. It's a shame sometimes when we don't notice it and we kind of ignore it. But if you, but if you look close enough, you'll see that His mercy and His grace, boy, they're they're all over the place in your life. And the closer you're looking at the the Master's face, the better you can see those things. And then we talked about for for help and protection, just like the, and in this case, the, and back in the olden days, way olden days, the, the master provided protection for the whole household, his family and also the servants and all that. And they were, even the servants were kind of like an extended family and uh, they needed that protection and, be, and getting a powerful master meant that you had uh, protection as well in that. And then for correction, um, that was also a job of the, the master to keep the servant in line. Well, we have a loving heavenly father who corrects us when we're getting off the path, not because, oh, I'm so mad at them. How can I hurt them? It's no, I love them so much. I don't want to see them living like that. And I need to help them to make correction in their life. And he does things to help us go down the right path because it betters our walk in our relationship with God. And then uh, now we're going to get into for authority and for reward, and, and we'll finish up the series with that. So for authority, um, first uh, passage that came to mind uh, was with the centurion, the Roman centurion, and we'll start there from Matthew chapter 8, and we'll start in verses uh, verse 5 and look through 5 through 7. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. In those three verses, there's a whole lot going on. Let's talk, let's talk about a few points. So I highlighted the first Lord as the first piece that I have highlighted. I've mentioned this in other sermons and Sunday school classes and stuff too. And you can kind of look at it. When somebody outside of, of the children of Israel came in, 
A lot of times they might say, thou son of David, and we saw a passage not too long ago where it said, Lord and son of David both together, and Jesus kind of ignored him like he didn't hear it. But when they just called out Lord, he seemed like he always was attentive to what they were asking because um, he, he's the savior of the whole world. He, he had the plan, and the plan from the beginning was that everybody had the opportunity to be saved, but he worked through the children of Israel, and that's how he came known throughout the world was through them, and he chose to do that. But, the, but this um, man was calling him Lord, and that showed some faith too. So he's a Roman calling a Jewish person Lord. That's a big deal, and it took a whole lot of faith to do that, and it took a whole lot of humility. So um, he, some, uh, here's some of the things I wrote down. He came with humility, and he came with compassion. He wasn't just asking for himself. He was asking for his servant. And, and, uh, and he also showed love. And um, what better motivation is there? That We know that God was motivated by love, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Think about it. What was God's motivation to come up with that plan? What was God's motivation for the son to be crucified on a cross? It was his love and his love for us. So this man comes with belief. He comes with humility and he comes with love. And he, and he comes to Jesus and Jesus in verse seven, this is actually even right here, stop it in verse, if we're not going to stop in verse seven, but if we did, that'd be pretty impressive already because he's not one of the children of Israel. And Jesus saith, I will come and heal him. There was no, there, that, that was, Jesus was prepared to do that. And by the way, Jesus is God in the flesh, God of the universe. The one who said, let there be light and there was light. He showed humility and didn't say, oh, you're not going to bring him to me? You want me to walk over to where he is? That's not what he said. He goes, I will come and heal him. So Jesus himself was a humble servant. These two guys had some similarities at different levels, but they had some similarities. And uh, the centurion points them out. And this is where um, we already talked about his humility and his faith, his compassion and his love. Um, now he's going to demonstrate, and so part of that was his faith. Now he's going to demonstrate great faith. He's going to demonstrate faith that made Jesus marvel. Wow. Often when Jesus did something for somebody, he, he went further than what that person was asking for, more than they could imagine he would do. And, and this, this centurion had, had a great deal of faith that Jesus himself marveled. So let's read on in verse 8. The centurion answered and said, Lord, there's that Lord again, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. There's humility again. But speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. And that was great faith that made Jesus marvel that he believed that just by the power of Jesus' word that his servant would be healed. Now, if you remember the, the guy that had... Um, had four friends that lowered him down through the ceiling. Um, they, they, Jesus commented on their faith. But here, he's like, you don't even need to come to my house. I'm not worthy to receive you. Just say the word. And that was great faith. But then he also, I'm going to add another thing. You can add understanding to that. Now, how much understanding, how far his understanding was, I don't know. But he seemed to have another level of understanding that most people didn't have. And he goes in verse nine, think about this. So it's a centurion who's over a hundred people, right? A hundred soldiers. He said, for I am a man under authority. He started it off with saying, instead of saying, I'm over a hundred people. He said, for I am a man under authority. That means I have to answer to somebody. I'm under authority of somebody higher up than me. That's how he started it. Then he said, having soldiers under me. And I say unto this man, go, and he goeth. And to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. And, and uh, the next, um, oh, I wanted to talk about, author this, is, this is the bullet point here is authority. We're going to do authority, then rewards in this uh, sermon. 
So, and you've heard Pastor talk about this quite a bit through, you know, various sermons. He talks about derived and intrinsic authority, where derived is just how it sounds. You got it from somewhere else. So, um, God is the one who dishes out all the authority, and then sometimes it continues to, to trickle down. Uh, like the authority a teacher might have, is, although it's really dwindled down over time, but the authority a teacher would have in the classroom, that's, that's given. Even the authority that a parent has is, is given by God. And, um, and you can just think of it like that. The, the police officers sometimes call the authorities, right? You know, we call them the authorities. Their authority is given to them, and, you know, and it could be taken away. But when you talked about intrinsic authority, it it's comes from within their character, from within, within their being. And we use that term in different things. Sometimes we might use the term intrinsic and that 100% really mean that it's intrinsic. The only true one that power is not that has power that's not derived, it's totally of himself and part of it, himself and his being and his character is God. So basically derived power is giving power or authority and that's what everybody has but God. And then intrinsic is not derived, but part of one's characteristic. That's just God. When you look at the really big picture, right? We might use it when we're talking about a company, the very top person, we might use that, but really that person still has derived power. But then uh, Jesus is an interesting case with this because Jesus is God-man. He's all God and all man. And, he, and by being God, he has all power and all authority. But he submitted himself unto the fa Father and came down to do the will of the Father. It kind of puts him in a very unique place. So um, I, uh, what the soldier was 100% thinking with this statement, I really don't know for sure. You can read commentaries and all that, but that's, a, that's what people think about that, but um, I think that Jesus does relate to that. He says, I am a man under authority. And then, you know, I, you know, so Jesus was coming down to do the will of the Father. He's God in the flesh. I don't know how much that centurion understood about that. I really don't know. But he did know that Jesus had the power and authority over diseases. And I assume that would go into spirits and different things like that. He saw them, he, he trusted in Jesus. And, um, but Jesus marveled at that saying, and he, he went and healed that person. So verse 10, when Jesus heard it, he marveled. That's pretty cool when Jesus marvels. There, there's a couple other times that we see it in, in a Syrophoenician woman, you know, he was pretty, I guess, Impressed. I don't know if I can use that word there, but he, it was noteworthy to Jesus in, in times like that. People's faith, ple faith pleases God. And, and Jesus in the flesh on this earth responded to faith and he saw it and he liked it. And uh, verse 10, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that follow, verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and, shit, uh, and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said in the centurion, Go thy way as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And the servant was healed in the selfsame hour. And it pretty much that means immediately, you know, because, you know, they didn't like say, oh, it's it's 11 minutes after seven or whatever like that. Or 22 seconds after, you know, 1122 after, you know, they don't do that. So that same hour pretty much just means that immediately he was healed. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, that, that power and authority that, that God gives. And, we, and here's an example uh, in Matthew chapter 10 where Jesus gives power to his apostles to go out and do his will. And that, and that first was to speak to the children of Israel, not to the Gentiles. But nevertheless, he, he gave them power to do it. And even us today, when God calls you to do something, and, and God still calls people, when he calls you to do something, he's going to give you the power needed to get it done. Otherwise, it really wouldn't be fair. That's one of the things that doesn't work in the workplace when you give somebody a responsibility, 
but not the authority to get it done. It just wreaks havoc and, and people can't stand that. And they can't work at a place where I'm responsible for all this stuff, but I have no authority to get anything done. So Jesus didn't do that to his apostles. He gave them uh, something, a task to do, a calling for them, and then he gave them the power to do it. And in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 10, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And then if we go down to verse 5, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not to the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go, preach. Now, were all those guys great preachers? Did they, were they all able to just spit out a sermon like that? Well, they were here. They were now because Jesus gave them the power to do that. Uh, without that, they couldn't heal anybody. Without that, they weren't going to be able to go and preach the gospel. And he said, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he gives us the power to do his will. will. So in Matthew chapter, two, look at in verse 8, he continues, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely have you received, freely give. Provide neither gold no, nor silver, nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet stays, for the workman is worth, worthy of his meat. That's a, that's a big ask, right? That's a lot to ask for. But he gave them the power to do that. That would be, without that, could you imagine having that daunting task or list of tasks to do that Jesus asked them to do, starting out with cast out devils, if it wasn't for Jesus giving the power, it'd be like, what? Cast out devils and, and, and so on and so on. But they were able to do that and, and not take any money. Don't even take a, a second set of clothes. Um, don't worry about anything. And, and Jesus gave them the power and the authority to do, to do all that. And by the way, power and authority are, are, are very similar. You can almost use them inter interchangeably, power and authority. So um, then the next passage that we'll look at is Matthew chapter 25. We're going to be in Matthew quite a bit today. So God-given talents, and this is the, the parable of the, the five talents um, in Matthew, starting in verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. So, God is the one that provides the talents, and the power, and the authority to do his will. Um, and we should be busy doing his business. And um, he has an ex expectation for us with the resources that he gave us, which with the talents, the power, however you want to look at it, that he gave us, um, he expects his work to be done in this world. And if you think about it today, with us fellow church members being part of the body of Christ, and together we make up the body of Christ, Christ is the head. So I, I often think about the five senses, and I know you heard me talk about it maybe, maybe too much, but we live in, a, in this physical world trying to get spiritual things done. Where God is the spirit, he's the head of the body. And in this physical world that we live in, Jesus is using this body in the world to get his spiritual work done. That's kind of cool. This is a physical world and we have a body. And together we make the body of Christ and we have work to do. And Christ uses us as the head He's the one supposed to be orchestrating everything and directing everything. All we have to do is do what we're supposed to do. And he'll take care of everything. Just like when you're a little kid, you didn't have to overthink things. I used to, those days, those, they're long gone, aren't they? Wasn't it kind of cool where all you had to do, worry about is, is uh, doing what your parents told you and walking close to them. And when, when you know, if you're standing next to your mom or your dad, you felt safe. 
Just like in the grocery, probably everybody has this experience in the grocery store where you'd look around and you don't see your parents right there and you kind of like panic. Where's my mom? Where's my dad? And you, you know, you kind of quickly go down the aisles till you, till you see them. Well, anyway, that's kind of like what we're talking about here in, in this sermon. So he has an ex expectation for us to be profitable in this world for his cause. And he wants, a, wants us to use the talents, the, which the resources, the power, the authority that he gives us in this world to do his will. And we're going to be accountable for that as well. So uh, a steward should be faithful. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of a man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self, for I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. So uh, back to Matthew 25, let's look at verse 16. And um, I have a few highlighted things here. Then he said, then he that had received the five talents went and traded the same and made them other five talents. So he received five talents and he made five talents more. That's being profitable with the resources that his master gave him. In verse 17, and likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. He should have at least came up with one more, right? Because God doesn't hold us responsible for things that he didn't give us the talents to do. But it's, it's according to the measure of faith, as another passage uh, gives. It's according to what he gives us, our resources, our talents that he has. And he knows those things. Not everybody here is given the talent to do whatever, you know, teach a class, uh, to preach or to be a pastor, that's a whole nother level right there. It's a lot harder than just preaching. and Or whatever it might be, a missionary or what, what have you. He gives us the, the resources needed, but he wants us to do his will in this world and be profitable for his cause. So there's a reckoning and um, the servant or the steward gets his just rewards. After a long time, the Lord of the servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that received the five talents came and uh, brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, and I highlighted this next part because you can almost hear the happiness in that I'm just reading it. But can you kind of, do you get the excitement that this man must have had out of there? He said, behold, I have gained beside them five more talents. He was happy to give his account. He was happy, happy for the reckoning that was taking place because he was faithful in what he did. And his Lord said unto him, this is a great thing right here. This is, I think, a top reward right here. Well done. That right there, I think, would be a top reward. Just like when you're a kid, or even today as a grown person, if your boss notices something and gives you credit for that and, and, and gives you a compliment, it's still good to hear or from a spouse, or whatever it is like that. But to hear it from the Lord, that would just be awesome. He said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. And I, I don't know how it's going to be, but I get more excited about the well done than I do ruler over many things. I don't know if you kind of feel that way. Just like the streets of gold, maybe that would be a great thing. But to be in the presence of our Lord, that's going to be awesome. So continuing on, he also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord uh, said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Now the unprofitable servant profits the master nothing. Then he, uh, then he which had received one talent came and said, Lord, 
I knew that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, uh, there thou hast that is thine. Here's your dollar back, or whatever. You know, here, here's your talent back. I, you know, I hid it in the ground. But did you see the difference between the other other ones that were, Lord, behold, and they and they were happy to give their account. Now this guy's, I was afraid, and I went and hid thy talent in the earth. He saw the Lord in a different way. Instead of a loving provider, uh, a loving father, or in this case, uh, uh, in the story, in this parable of a loving master, he sees him as something that he wants to hide from or be or avoid. And I don't think he was looking forward to the master's return in this day of reckoning. And his and the master was wroth. His, and his Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. Those two things go hand in hand. He wasted the, the talent that he was given from his master. He said, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sow not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury or with some interest. So I'm sure back in then it would have just been a little bit of interest, just like it is a little bit of interest today. I don't know how much, but you could have at least done something with what God gave you. And you hear, you hear that message? You can at least do something. So maybe you're not going to go out there and be a missionary. Maybe you're not going to go out there and start a church. Maybe you're not going to even, maybe you're not going to fully use, maybe none of us do, fully use the talents that God gave you. But at least you could have gave your talent to the exchanger. That wouldn't have took much effort, would it? We could do something. We can help in somebody else's ministry. We could be. We could talk to somebody that comes to church. It could be small things. And he's saying, you could have at least done that. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him that hath ten talents. I'm sorry. Yeah, ten talents. Oh yeah, he has ten talents now because he had five and he got five more. So uh, so we bring many. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, Romans 12, 5, 8. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. So God's dishing it out, right? God's the one who's supplying it, and he supplies the measure of it too. So you don't compare yourself to me, and I don't compare myself to you. What you but we are accountable to use what God has given us. Now, what that is, it's God that knows that and whatever he's revealed to you. And he says, whether prophecy, let us prophecy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. So we're going to utilize the talent that God gave us, that and uh, the, that other power, that authority that God has given us, or that we're supposed to utilize that proportionally to the measure of it that He has given us. And we're supposed to build on the rock. So and this um, sometimes is a vacation Bible school verse, and we've had it more than once. For other foundation can, can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, and, you know, there's two sets right there, gold, silver, precious stones, good stuff, wood, hay, and stubble, they're not so good stuff, Right? Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So as we know, tried by fire, the gold, the silver, and the precious stones will just be purified. The wood, the hay, and the stubble will burn off. But the things that you build on, on the foundation, 
um, on the Lord, on Jesus, will stand. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. I think, did, what, Brother Bill, didn't you sing a song about the purifying pot or something like that? Am I making a mistake on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That kind of reminds me of this. Uh, something to lay at Jesus' feet. Now, I don't fully understand this, and probably nobody else does either, but there's, there's a part that I do know, and then there's part I'm not clear on because the Bible doesn't give us enough information on it. But I know we get crowns. I don't know explicitly that we'll be the ones laying it at Jesus' feet. Perhaps it kind of makes sense that we would, but the example in the Bible or the part in the Bible where it talks about laying down the crowns, it's 24 saints doing that. So I don't. it doesn't say they're the only 24, there's none more. It doesn't say that one way or the other. But it does say here, Paul, Paul gives us this information though that we get crowns too because of what he said. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He very well may be one of the 24, you know, kind of thing. But he goes on to say, which the Lord, uh, the righteous judge shall give me at that day and not to me only, but this is, this is where he says that we can know that we can receive crowns too. But unto all them also that love is appearing. Well, who loves the appearing of the Lord? Who loves the appearing of their Lord? It's the ones that are busy doing the Lord's work. Just like the parable uh, that we did of the five talents. Um, the ones that were like, behold, Lord. You know, I, you know and, and here's, what I, here's what I received more. They were happy at the Lord's return. But the one that just hid his talent in, in the ground, basically he did nothing for God. He lived, the Lord provided him with, with some talent that he never used, and he just went on wasting it, and the Lord received no profit from that servant. So what is the profit that he's going to receive is when we're doing his will, other people are going to come to know Christ as their Savior and Lord. The Lord is not willing that any should perish. He wants us all to be saved, but he gives everybody a choice whether uh, to choose him or not to choose him. But he wants everybody to hear the message. And uh, when we don't do our part, we're letting our master down in that situation, and we're not utilizing the power. We're not utilizing the talent that God has given us to be his worker, his part of his body in this world, getting his spiritual work done. So uh, we're almost finished here. I guess I might be a few minutes early. But um, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We already talked about that a little bit, but what better thing would there be to hear? I certainly don't want to hear thou wicked and slothful servant. That doesn't sound good at all. I don't even want to hear, well, at least you gave it to the money exchangers. I, I, I want to hear a little better than that. This would be a great thing to hear. I, whether I'll hear it, I don't know, but that, that would be uh, my hope. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over men or many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And that is the... Uh, the last part of this sermon, looking unto the Lord our God, and, and that's based on how a servant looks upon the hand of his master. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for what a great God that you are, Lord. I thank you for your grace, your love, and your mercy, Lord. And I thank you for all the blessings that, that you give me and you give my loved ones, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be looking at you for all these things that we went over, First, if there's anyone who hasn't called upon your name for salvation, Lord, I pray, Lord, that they can look upon you, Lord, for that, and they can trust you in that, Lord. And for those that do know you as Savior and Lord, I pray, Lord, that we can have the faith to look to you, Lord, for all those other things, Lord, for our protection, for our grace, for your mercy, Lord, and that we can look at uh, 
look unto you, Lord, for the power and authority, Lord, to do your will in this world. Help us, Lord, to, to stay faithful, Lord, to the calling that you give us. Help us, Lord, to live a life, Lord, where we're ready for the master servant, ready for whatever it is you have us to do, Lord. And Lord, I pray for those that are on the prayer list again, Lord. I pray for each and every one of them, Lord, that we all together, Lord, lift them up to you, Lord, for your divine help, Lord. And we love you and we pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Stand with me. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. Brother Dale, if he'll close his...